And then there's another kingdom, and that is the kingdom of God. And that kingdom consists of recreated persons, persons who have been born again anew, persons who have made Christ their Lord and in whom Christ is honored, persons who have no confidence in fallen humanity, persons who have no confidence in the soundness of man's moral judgment, but believe that left to himself man will always go wrong. Persons who know that they can do nothing in themselves and have no confidence in the flesh or in their own strength. Persons who trust in God alone to do an immortal work in them and through them. Now, these are called Christians, and they make up the true Church of Christ of whatever denomination. But it's a different kingdom altogether. There's the kingdom of man, and there is the kingdom of God. And those two kingdoms coexist, and sometimes they spill over into each other as water spills over into the boat and has to be bailed out. They get together. And uh, I suppose there isn't any church anywhere that is totally, totally, totally committed to the kingdom of God to a point where everything is done by God. I suppose there will be a little bit of flesh and a little bit of old Adam and a little bit of the kingdom of this world get into all churches. I've never heard of one that didn't have a little of it. Then there are churches that have almost totally given themselves over to the kingdom of man. And their philosophy is man's philosophy. Their beliefs is man, uh, are, are man's beliefs. And their viewpoint is man's viewpoint. And they, they go the way man goes, and they live the way man lives, and yet they call themselves churches. Then there are such churches as this, where an effort at least is made that the majority of what we do should be divine, and the majority should be on the side of the kingdom of God, but where undoubtedly around the edges there are things that, are, that God's not in. And the business of a minister and the business of elders and deacons and church members and Christians everywhere is to keep the church and make the church just as pure as she can be, and to keep all the kingdom of man out of her and to keep her so replete with the kingdom of God that when you step into the fellowship of the saints, you step into a divine fellowship, a fellowship dedicated to the proposition that all men are bad until they're made good by the blood of the Lamb, dedicated to the proposition that we're on the wrong road until we find the road home to God through the cross, dedicated to the belief that it's only God in us that can do an immortal work. And so we in the kingdom of God have for our motto, in everything by prayer, because, you see, we've already admitted we can't do anything. We've already admitted there's nothing in human muscle that can do the work of God. We've already admitted there's nothing in the human brain that can think the word of God. We've all work of God. We've already admitted that there's nothing in human nature good enough to build in to the temple of holiness which God is raising in his universe. We already have admitted that. How then can we do? What shall we do? Hunt a monastery somewhere and hide ourselves away? No. We're to be in active work, but we're to do it by prayer, in everything by prayer. Now let me show you the contrast between the kingdom of man and the kingdom of the world, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man, and then you see how locate yourself, locate this church, locate me. Locate us, locate ourselves in this. Now, the world says in everything by money. Just have money enough, you can do anything. Everything. Money talks, and money opens doors, and it's money, money, always money. The more money, the better we get on. Always money. Christ hadn't a dime. But we say money, we had more money. But the church says, in everything by prayer, the church says we're wise enough to know that money's needed in the kingdom of God and that God uses it and says let everybody lay up in store on the first day of the week. We know that. And we know that when we give, God takes it and blesses it. He has spread abroad, he has given to the poor, scattered abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. We know that. We know that in the kingdom of God, God uses money, but he uses it only because everything is done by prayer. But if you have money without prayer, you have a great curse on you. I believe the greatest curse could happen to Avenue Road Church, 
would be for somebody to will us a hundred thousand dollars and the Lord not to raise up praying people commensurate with it. If God will raise up men and women commensurate with the gift, then I wouldn't hesitate to accept a hundred thousand dollars and put it to work. But you get money without prayer and you have a curse. Get prayer without money and it's amazing what God can do and where he'll find money. Amazing where he'll find money. So the world says in everything by money. And then churches rise up and they're dedicated to the kingdom of this world without knowing it. The kingdom of man and so they try to run the church the way man runs the church. One man said, well, he said, I'm a such and such, that is, uh, he, he was a certain denomination, which I'll try not to divulge. But he said, there hasn't been anybody interested in my soul in all these years. He said, nobody. He said, I make my pledge yearly and I send in my check monthly, and nobody has bothered me in years. He said, I never go to church. Said, Why don't you go to church? I never go to church because nobody's interested in me. He said, they're only interested in my pledge and my check. And he said, I see to it that I get my pledge and my check in. That takes care of my religious responsibility. Now, he was sarcastic in that. He didn't believe it, but he knew the church believed it. The church got his check, and that's what they wanted. He could stay home. The pastor could preach to his empty seat because uh, the check was in. I'll take the people. You can have the checks. I'll take the people, God's people, God's good, loving people. I love the people. But you know, I find that if you get the fish, you get the coin. And uh, you, you get the, the fish, the big coin in his mouth. And uh, if you get the sheep, they'll have wool on his back. So it isn't a choice between getting the people and getting the money, because if you get the people, you get the money. The point is, if you go after the money and don't care about the people, we're hirelings and not shepherds. And the church that only wants some, somebody's money, it's no church at all. It's running after the principles of the kingdom of man. And then the world says, in everything by social prestige. I flipped the radio on last night. After I'd gone to bed, I have a little radio. I don't listen to daytime to it, but at night I sometimes do, often do. And uh, somebody was being interviewed as Shaka Gabur was her name. Now, I don't know whether you know Shaka or not, but she was being interviewed. And I listened a while to what Jaja had to say. And everything by social prestige. Get up there, get up there, and get to know somebody. And uh, they say it's not uh, what you know, but uh, whom you know. Get to know people, big shots. Well, I've always felt that social prestige won't do it. Christ was born in a manger. And Peter was a fisherman, and John was a fisherman. And Levi was a despised tax collector. And the early church came up out of people that didn't amount to very much. Not many, not many are wise, not many are learned, not many are rich, not many, a few, but not many. The early church was born up out of the lower stratum uh, of, strata of society and not out of the higher strata. She came up, she came up from the common people. And the people who did miracles and went about everywhere doing miracles were common people. And uh, some, some of our modern critics, our, our modern uh, scholars, uh, shake their heads over Peter's Greek. They say, Peter's Greek wasn't so good. Said, it wasn't anything like Paul's Greek. No, it wasn't so good Greek. But he managed to write some epistles that have blessed a few million people down the centuries. And uh, he managed to preach a sermon that converted 3,000, and uh, he managed to do a few other things, and yet his Greek wasn't so good. I suppose that uh, if he had been a more proficient in the Greek, he would not have had one ounce of power more than he had, uh, than he had, because everything was done by prayer. It was not by social prestige, but by prayer. 